coming up. A legendary producer tells us two stories that are gonna make you laugh with joy. Uh, one of the most successful producers ever tells us how he was in the middle of working with Aretha Franklin. And a 19-year-old rookie walked into his studio with a powerhouse confidence that he'd never seen before and recorded a number one smash in just one take. Now that began a legendary career that few have equaled. Then he tells another story about another legend that challenged him and others in a game of basketball after recording a hit. And with seven inch heels and a puffy shirt schooled everybody on that court. I'll tell you, this is a can't miss next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to watch American Bandstand and discovered new artists and songs from that Touchstone show of our youth, you're going to want to subscribe below right now. Click the red button. Be a part of our community. I also take a look at our offering on Patreon, a lot more content there, and uh, also our merch so excited to be back with you. I've been down and out with kidney stones, and I'm really excited to, to, to get back on track here. So we've talked a lot on this channel about the music today versus music of yesteryear. I, for one, I love great music. I mean, a good song is a good song. I don't care if it came from Led Zeppelin or Britney Spears. Hey, Baby One More Time is a good song. I mean, this cover by the band Travis proves it. point is, I try to recognize a great song or a great singer or interpreter of song. I don't feel like I'm imprisoned by genre or personal bias. If my least favorite singer or uh, band writes or sings a song that is great, um, I'll recognize that. I don't want to be stuck in my ways. Take Whitney Houston for an example. She's simply one of the greatest singers in history. Whether you like pop or, or not, it doesn't matter. She has a a distinct, colorful, and soul-galvanizing sound to her, her voice. I fell in love with her at first listen. I mean, the vocal control that she conveyed in the 80s and 90s is almost without compare. Some people have never given her the time of day because it's pop music, and I think that's so close-minded. She was ripping up the charts at the very same time as uh, the other queens of the pop machine, Madonna, Janet Jackson, of course, later Mariah Carey and Celine Dion, I could go on and on. And even though I'm personally more partial to Janet uh, overall in that department, Whitney's voice is just incomparable. That's why when the tastemakers of today throw out uh, Taylor Swift, and Billie Eilish and Rihanna and even Cardi B, I try not to scoff at the comparison. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude, but none of those modern day chart busters hold a candle to Whitney or Janet. But even pop wise, I'm talking straight pop, Whitney makes it look easy. Take a song like today's number one hit that we're gonna cover. If you put it under the microscope, uh, 1985's How Will I Know. It's a straightforward, hooky pop song sung by a very young Whitney Houston. But when you really listen to the song and you hear that absolutely palpable pool of joyful exuberance that, that comes out of Whitney. It's just feel good times 10. It's that pure and angelic voice that we miss so much since uh, you know, she passed away. And that joyous smile when she was singing those pop ditties, it was just so magnetic. Sadly, Whitney Houston passed away in 2012. Her music will no doubt live forever. And today, we're going to celebrate her through uh, her constant collaborator and musical partner, Narda Michael Walden. Now, Narda, one of my favorite people in music. He's just one of the, one of the good guys. He's stellar drummer who of course played in the Mahavishnu Orchestra and then became one of the greatest producers of the modern era, working with everybody from Aretha Franklin to Whitney to George Michael, Sting, Journey. He just produced their new album that's about to come out, Elton John, just to name a few. He co-wrote and produced Whitney's number one hit, How Will I Know, and he ends up telling us the story of creating that song with Whitney and uh, gives us uh, Really, a, a nice look into that partnership. And how she walked right into his studio and ripped off a number one hit 
in one take. Narda Michael Walden also tells us the story of the time that he ran into Prince and the purple one challenged him and Morris Day uh, of the time to a game of basketball in Seven Inch Hills. Stay tuned for some great stories. And as is always the case with Narda, it's a can't miss. As we step into this interview, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Now with over 40 million pairs sold, it's no surprise why. I mean, Zenny has really the most magnetic styles and distinct colors. They really up your style repertoire. Really. Take a look at their newest styles at zenny.com. The link is below. So Whitney, how will I know? Mm -hmm. One of the most incredible artists in the history of mankind. I mean, nobody sang or will ever sing like Whitney Houston. I mean, growing up and hearing her stuff, I was just, I was blown away. And this album, it has the, the ballads mm -hmm. and it has the R&B, but they needed that pop song that really popped, take her to radio and take it to all generations. And that's exactly what it did. Thank you. Tell me what you remember about starting out because you were working on some stuff with Aretha when you got called to do How Will I Know. Yes. Tell me about how that came together. I was cutting uh, the Freeway of Love, Who's Zooming Who, at the Automat Studios in San Francisco for Aretha and really uh, focused because I knew that had to be right. And I got a phone call from Jerry Griffith from Arista Records. And Jerry said, I really want you to work on a song for Whitney Houston. I said, Jerry, I don't have time. I'm really right in the middle of making this Aretha record. And he knew that. But he said, but you don't want to sleep on this because she'll be, she'll be a big artist. I go, well, what, you know? He said, Sissy was Houston's daughter. I go, oh, okay, I know Sissy Houston because she sang my first album, Garden Love Life. I said, okay. He said, let me send you an idea of a song we got for her. I said, okay. And then a few days later, I got a, I got a, a song called How Will I Know? It was a chorus, but there was no verse. Wasn't it the demo that Shannon Rubicon mm -hmm. did? That's and George right, Merrill? that's right. They're geniuses, man. And I, I said, this is a strong chorus, but there's no verse. So I said, well, I said, you know, I mean, I'd love to work, but I had to rewrite the song. If that's the case, and I have to make time to do that. He said, well, let me, let, me, let me call the writers back, Shannon and George, and see how they feel about that. And it was like magic, boom, go ahead and do it. I said, okay. So I just stopped what I was doing for the minute, went to the piano, banged out. It's just a sketch, you know? And then gave it to the cats, George and Shannon, and then they wrote the lyric, sent it back. I then cut the track with, with Randy and Corrado, the same team again. I flew to New York on an overnight because they wanted it right away. I met with Whitney in the studio at Media Sound with Michael Barbiero, and she walked in looking like a million dollars, like you know how she can look. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, I, had no, I, didn't, I hadn't seen her, I didn't know. I was like, whoa, you know? So then, you know, after we talked a little minute, and one thing she had told me on the phone before I got there, she says, don't change the key, keep it high. I said, are you sure it's really, really high? I'm, I'm going to put the first da-da-da really high. She says, don't change it. I said, okay. So when I got there, I met her. She was so cool. She goes on the mic, the headphones. Okay, let's go for it. I mean, the first take is what you're hearing. She was <laughs> that flawless. That in tune, that, that much focus and purpose. And I was like, Damn, you just nailed it. She said, I'll do it for you another time just you have a, you know, a little option. I said, okay. And she did another time. You know what I mean? And I said, well, maybe you want to just come in and listen. So she did. She came and she sat in like one of those chairs you can lean back in. And if you're me, I'm her. She leans back in the chair looking fine and just staring at me. As it's blurring over the speaker, just staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. She's really confident. I said, she's really confident. And she's like, you know, yeah, I, I sound real good. I said, yeah, you sound real good. <laughs> she's like, so I was taken by her level of confidence. It wasn't that some phony ego. It's as great as what you're hearing on that record, but her staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I said, this is a real force. This is a real, because we're used to hearing that kind of sound, you know, that kind of big sound, maybe like a bigger woman. She wasn't, she was like that thing, that yeah. thing. 
She was like tall and very yeah. thin. It's like, how can you make that kind of sound? Your lead vocal's done. Let's get, let's get, let's get your mom in. And maybe you. So she's your mom right? sing background vocals. I said, on. get him in. Let's come and have him sing some background on this. Let's just, just do it. She, she called him up. Boom, they came in. And the, and the, the mother and two others just sang, I stood around the mic and sang the backing. And I was like, this is great. We need to go out there and join them because I, I missed her voice in it. And she went out there and joined them. That was the sound I wanted. Her mom, Whitney, and the two ladies that came with them. That became the backing. How will I know? Just feel it. And then after they sang it, and I stacked them up so it sounded really huge, then they were done. I said, well, let me get my friend in who can bring that Clement type sound. I couldn't get Clarence. He was on the road with Bruce. I have a friend named Russell Tubbs. I make Russell Tubbs. I said, come in and blow that kind of sound for me on the sax. And he did. And that's the sound you're on the sax. I said, well, while I'm here, I haven't got a lot of time. I was just mix it. I said, Michael Barbier, you're a bad cat. Just help me mix it. So we mixed it. <laughs> and it was done. <laughs> it was done, man. Number one pop record. Like number that. one on the AC charts. Number one on the like R&B that. charts. I mean, yeah. Whitney Houston was in a league of her own. And I show my kids, I'm like, let me show you a pop star. Okay. And so I play them, How Will I Know, and, and uh, So Emotional, all these incredible songs. And they're like, who is that, Dad? Mm -hmm. Who is that? It's Whitney Houston. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't think there'll ever be another. No, you're right. I mean, you got to imagine, she learned from her mom, who sang backing on almost every major record out of New York, even toured with Elvis Presley and all that. I mean, all the Rita Franklin records, as you know, could be Sissy in there somewhere. Dionne Warwick records, as Sissy's in there somewhere. All that education she had. Yeah. She's taught, taught Whitney how to be the best. She said, if you're going to be in the singing game, we're going in the basement, we're going to woodshed, and you're going to become the best singer ever. And she became that. And don't forget, Dionne Warwick is in part of her family. <laughs> Aretha Franklin's her godmother. I mean, all this royalty is like right there for her. So she's like drawing on that as a little girl. And I remember I met her, not realizing it was Whitney Houston, I'm Garden Love Light. Sissy brought her daughter, she's like 11 years old. She sat in the chair and watched the session. She's a little beautiful little girl. That was Whitney. <laughs> but I didn't realize that would be the girl I'd be producing yeah. in my life. But dang, she absorbed all that. So it's, it's God's plan. I mean, you look at a person like Muhammad Ali, right? Muhammad Ali, we call him the greatest boxer of all time. But he learned from watching Sugar Ray Robinson and just digesting the best before him. How to be fast, how to stick and move like that. You know what I mean? How to be a heavyweight and move like a middleweight. So here's Whitney the same way. Learning how to like move from the chest oh, to the head yeah. like Aretha would do, or her mother would teach her, or how Dion could do. All those tricks, she, the traits she would learn. How to hold the mic, how to, you know, every little thing about it. All that range, Everything. all that power, all how that How to look beauty. at the producer and stare the producer down when the sound of howling was flowing over the speaker <laughs> and, and dare me to say anything. <laughs> See what I'm saying? All it. that, man. At 19. At 19. Later on, she did that at the Nelson Mandela concert. It was always a special song to her. Did you ever hear when Sam Smith covered it? I did. I've fallen in love whenever we meet. Yeah, I did. Think? After hearing what she did, uh, I can appreciate other things, but it's nothing like what she did. I mean, you know. Well, you can't. I got I to be honest I mean, about it. Yeah. After I've been boxing Muhammad Ali, I mean, everybody else is cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I love it. Tell me this Prince story real quick. I oh, think we got It's just really simple. It. After doing the storm with Elton John in the Sunset Sound, and I was really elated and high after working with Elton and getting great vocals and writing songs on the piano. And then the word comes that Prince is in this, the other room down, down the way. He is? So I let Prince know I'm there. He says, stop in. And I do. And it's like, uh, you walk into the room and he's got three, is it humidifiers that make the steam go? Mm -hmm. Humidifiers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, humidifiers. That, you know, humidifiers. One next to him, one here, another one. So the whole room is full of this steam. So that's kind of like unusual in a recording studio, in a yeah. room. And then he's sitting uh, playing guitar by the console with the, with the, with the, the switches here the, 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 you know, and a foot switch. So I sit down and then it's, I notice over the corner is Morris Day. So I sit down and I, I watch him. He didn't say anything. 
I sit down and I watch him overdub guitar. Stop it. So I watch, that's how he records. Yeah. He has the stop and the start, the record and the stop with his foot. So he doesn't need an engineer. He can punch himself in and do anything he wants by himself. And the drum track sounded hot. And I only heard the guitar part with the bass. And then I heard a little bit of vocal from Morris. But then he stopped. He said, let's take a break. I said, okay. So he went out to this courtyard and there's a basketball hoop there. So he said, let's play a game of 21. So I have on my red Tama can shoes. So he's saying, oh yeah, get your red Tama cans on. That's how he talks, like kind of feminine. Oh, you got your red Tama cans on. Yeah, I do. But he's got seven inch, seven inch boots, heels. His hair's in his face. He's got a cold. Morris has got maybe cool shoes on, not like high boots. So the game begins. And before I know it, everything Prince throws up at the Thinkles is a swish. I mean everything, like, <laughs> like, 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 like Stephen Curry. You know Stephen Curry? Oh yeah. Like that. Three point range, swish. Close, swish. Everything, swish. I mean, I don't care what it is, it's in. So the game was over like that. He got 21 points, Morris Day got 16 points, I got 13. And all during the, during the game, he's cracking about me, about my shoes. <laughs> hey, hey, Tom McCann, swish. Hey, right, Tom McCann, swish. Don't even look at the basket, just swish. I mean, truly those stories about Dave Chappelle with Charlie Murphy and Eddie playing basketball are true. Good. In your face, Charlie Murphy. Good. Good hustle. You think I'm making it up? You think I'm trying to, uh... Well, I gotta admit, um, it's a good game. I wish I could say the same for you and the crew of flunkies. And I made them pancakes after all that stuff's true. He's a genius basketball player. Just as good on guitar and writing songs and on the stage dancing, he's just that good playing basketball. Gosh. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. So, gosh, man. That was a day. Hey, thanks so much for watching. What are your thoughts on Whitney Houston and this pop song? Share with us in the comments. Also, your memories of 1985. Let us know below. If you like our content, make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out on our daily videos on the rock era. Make sure to check us out on Patreon as well. That helps us keep this mission of keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.